Well, if this is your first time here this morning, uh, Calvary Chapel, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We are in the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be covering at least some of chapter 4. I don't know how far we'll get. I'll keep an eye on the clock. So we're not here until 2. Um, and if possible, we may try to get into chapter 5. I got a sneaky feeling we ain't going to make it. Deuteronomy chapter 4. You know, when, when I read through the, the Bible, it's so easy to gravitate toward the, the Gospels or the book of Acts or Romans, uh, any of Paul's writings. It's so easy to gravitate toward that. Uh, and, and a lot of times we, or me, I should say, not we, I will shy away from the Old Testament books. Eh, it's dry, it's boring. Man, I tell you what, this came alive this week for me. Uh, and it was a blessing for me to, to spend some time studying over this, and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you as well. Starting in verse 1, it says, Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So Moses, is this, this whole book, Deuteronomy, is repetition of the law or the second law, uh, is kind of a repetition of what had already been taught through the book of Exodus. And so Moses, if you recall, is getting ready to, uh, he's, he's got all of the Israelites there at the, at the end of the, the journey through the wilderness. He's already been told, uh, you're not getting in, but the descendants of all of those folks that were in the wilderness, they're going on into the promised land. So he's kind of preparing them for this journey across the Jordan. And it says now, Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. But this next, this next sentence, Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land. It's very easy to hear and for us as human beings to understand what this says. But are we willing to follow what it says? Are we willing to obey the words that are written here? And when it says that don't add to or don't take away in the Hebrew, it, it literally meant every jot and tittle. Don't add one little iota to the word here, and don't take away one little iota from the word here. And it also means that we can't really just pick and choose what we want to obey and what we don't want to obey. That's not, that's not our decision. I mean, we can decide that if we want to, but it doesn't make it right. Verse 3. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. And if you don't remember, if you want to flip back into Numbers chapter 25... That's when they were literally bringing in the aliens, if you will, and they were marrying into those uh, different uh, groups of people, and they were beginning to worship these other idols, if you will. And God sent a plague, and he was killing everyone who was participating in that. And if you remember, Eleazar's son, what was his name? Phineas drove a spear through a man and a woman who had just entered into a tent and killed them both. And at that moment, the plague stopped. 24,000 people died because of that plague. God's not playing around. And it's still the same God, by the way. He didn't change. God doesn't change. The same God that's talking about here is the same one that we serve today. Verse 5. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them, there it is again, follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully. 
For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Think about this. Prior to this, prior to the, the hierarchy set up by Moses and having the judges underneath him to help keep the people in line, answering questions and making rulings, and then if it was too big for the judge, then it went on up to Moses. It was more or less a government style, if you will, with Moses being the head, the voice of God to the Israelites. No other nation had anything like this. It was, it was crazy. I mean, if you think, if you watch any of those shows about the Vikings, you got one guy that's kind of sitting there, and he's the head of his tribe, and then you got another little guy sitting over here on this, and he's the head of his tribe. I mean, it was just chaos. They were all doing their own thing. So God, through this nation of Israel, began to set up the governance, if you will, of how things will move forward in an organized fashion. That's why he's saying here, will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Before, before all of this, for the other nations, there was no foundation. There, there was nothing. It was utter chaos. So God is setting up this nation of Israel as an example to the other nations on how to even coordinate activities within a people group. Verse 7. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Wow. Wow. Remember, this is, this is the same God that we're serving today. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? When we pray, church, does it feel like God is near us? Or is it like he's far, far, far away and he's not really even paying any attention? What, what, what is our attitude in our heart when we go to the Lord in prayer? Is it with anticipation that he is going to, or expectation that he is going to hear our prayer and that he is going to answer them? If so, man, that's great. We serve a living God, the living God, the only living God. We need to go to him in prayer with expectation. Not that he is going to answer it the way that we want, because we want a lot of things and we've at least I'm going to say I, not we. I have prayed for a lot of stupid things in my lifetime. I have prayed to make a free throw shot on a basketball court. God, if you'll just allow me to make this shot, I'll do whatever you want. God is not a genie in a lamp. That's not what God is. <laughs> Man, I, 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 it's hard to find words to even describe him. Verse 8 again, and what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? That's not normally what I think of when I think of laws. Oh, yay, we have laws, so we're a great nation. Because normally I'm trying to figure out ways to get around them. What are the little tricks I can, you know, what's the risk or what's the chance that there's a cop on the highway as I'm going down at over the speed limit. I'm not going to say how fast. Over the speed limit. Am I willing to take that risk? Most of the time, yes. But our, our goal as believers should not be how far can we get to the edge without falling off? How far can I press the envelope on these decrees, these laws, the, the word of God, and still be called a Christian? That's not what the Bible teaches us. We're, we're supposed to be sidling up next to him, not being as far away as possible. Well, I, Jesus, I still see you. I'm right here. No, we're right next to him. 
That's where we're supposed to be. Verse 9. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Church, how are we doing in that regard? Are, are, are we, well, with my kids it was the Veggie Tales. How many of you remember the Veggie Tales? We relied on the Veggie Tales to teach the kids about the Bible. No, 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 no. That's not what this says. This says that we are to teach your children and their children after them. Why? Because we have not forgotten the things that our eyes have seen and we've not let them slip from our heart. Now, we might not have lived through the parting of the Red Sea. We, did, we weren't there. We didn't see it. We didn't see all of the plagues. We didn't see the, the firstborn of the nation of, Israel, of Egypt being wiped out. We didn't see any of that. We have it recorded for us, right? But I guarantee you, each and every one of us have seen the miraculous hand of God in our lives. Are we keeping that in our mind? Are we keeping that in our heart to remind us of who it is we serve? And by reading this word on a regular basis, it helps us to stay focused where our focus needs to be. Verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. There it is again. Church, it's our responsibility to pass it on from generation to generation to generation. It is not the responsibility of who is behind the pulpit. It is a family's responsibility to, take, to teach their children the word of God. Verse 11. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow. There it is again, commanded you to follow. And then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow. There it is again. In the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Verse 15. You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. You think there's a reason why we saw, they saw no form? There was. Remember that golden calf? You couldn't build a golden something if you couldn't see anything as an idol to replace God. All you heard was the voice. And if you go back and you read that passage, you'll see that they were scared to death. Oh, Moses, you, you go take care of that. Bring the word back to us. We don't want to have anything to do with this. They were fearful of the Lord. That's why it did, he had no form. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, verse 16, so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his, his inheritance as you now are. Verse 21. I find this humorous. Last week Daniel talked about it just a little bit. Verse 21. The Lord was angry with me because of you. And he solemnly swore that I would not get to cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. It's all your fault. No, I didn't say that last part. That was me. 
I don't think that Moses, in the writing of this, had the tone that I just portrayed when he wrote this. He knew that he wasn't getting into the promised land. And yeah, he kind of takes a jab at the Israelites. But I think what he is letting them know is, listen, guys, we got all of these laws, we got all these decrees, we got the Ten Commandments, and just in this, this chapter, up to this point, we're not even halfway through, I don't think, how many times did it say, follow these decrees, follow these teachings, follow this, this, this? Several times already, right? And here you have Moses reminding them, guys, hey, God told me to speak to that rock and I smacked it with a stick. And because of that, now I don't get to go in. Imagine what's going to happen if you go in there and you do not follow these laws, decrees, commandments. I think he's letting them know, this is no laughing matter. We need to take this very, very seriously, what we have here as far as the decrees and the laws. I think that's the reason why Moses put it in there. Although it's funny to say that he's blaming the Israelites. Verse 22, it says, I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan, but you are about to cross over and take possession of that good land. Verse 23, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. Why? Verse 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. Listen, it's not jealousy in the same way that we as humans get jealous. He wants the best for us. And when we start substituting his goodness with our own idea of goodness, it makes him very upset because he has so much more to offer us. And a lot of times we don't even see it. It's like we've got blinders on because we are selfish, we are full of ego, we are full of pride. And we can't see God's goodness that he has already designed for us as his beings, as his followers, as his children. He has so much more for us. Verse 25. After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time. What's that next word? If. If. Moses knows what's going to happen. He puts the if in there just to make him feel better, I think. If you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and only a few of you will survive. He must have already known what the ending was, huh? This is all before the people of Israel started really going through some trials. Moses knew. God let him know. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which your Lord, the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. Church, how many of those do we have in our life? Is our sole focus upon Jesus Christ? Or is it a side note? Is it, the end of, is it at the end of our to-do list for the week? That I can check off, yeah, I went to church, check. I prayed, check. Or is it the sole reason for everything that we do? But if... Verse 29, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Man, that's a powerful verse. In my lifetime, my journey hasn't been much different than the Israelites. I do good for a while, I'm following what I'm supposed to be doing. And then all of a sudden, boy, I just get derailed. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it doesn't happen to you. But I, I can tell you this. What I just read is absolutely true. Because I've experienced it. 
I have called out to the Lord with all my heart, only to be restored again to him. And church, right now, if you are in a position where, you know what, I'm not as close to the Lord as I, I should be. I'm not as close to the Lord as I have been in the past. Or, man, I tell you what, I, I'm just hanging on by a thread right now with my relationship with Jesus Christ. Today is the day that you can say, Jesus, with all of my heart, I cry out to you. I, I need you in my life as a Savior. Today's the day. Verse 30. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your forefathers, which he confirmed to them by an oath. And listen, church, they had the oath to his ancestors. We have Jesus Christ. He is the oath that was given to us as believers who died that death on the cross to take away all of our sin. Past, present, future. Everyone who is now alive on the earth, none of us were here when Jesus died on the cross. But our sins, if we go to him and ask for forgiveness and repent of those sins, they're gone as far as the east is from the west. Jesus is our covenant. All right, this next section, man, I tell you what, this is the, we're starting to get into some really good stuff, even better than what we just read. I'm going to read this whole section. I, you know, I was figuring out how should I break this down. I, I can't. It's, it's coming all at you all at once. Here we go, verse 32. Ask now about the former days long before your time from the day God created man on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything so great as this ever happened? Or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders by war, or by signs and wonders by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made his, you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire, because he loved your forefathers and chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Emphasis added by me, by the way. Keeping or keep his decrees and commands, which I am giving you today, so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Now, is that not some good preaching? That's some good preaching right there. All I had to do was read the word. Now, let's go back and let's, let's dive into this just a little bit. Has any, verse 33, has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? This week... Uh, as I was studying for this, I uh, was asking Dana a couple of questions. I, oh, what do you think about this or that? And she said, oh, that's a, good, that's a good point. You know, I work with someone who attend a Messianic Jewish synagogue, and he's actually going to, uh, it's down in Macon, by the way. Uh, he's actually going to the seminary, the rabbinical seminary. They've got another word for it. 
Bathsheba, I think. Don't hold me to that pronunciation. And she said, you ought to give him a call and see what he thinks about some of this stuff. And, and we had, it was almost an hour-long conversation uh, about some of the history and why things are the way they are. And it was really, really interesting from his point of view. But as we went through that, uh, he shared some things with me I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> but when it talks here about what Moses is describing, has any other God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation? And this whole next, all the way down through verse 34. Um, it was really, really interesting as I, as I was studying for it. He said, if you think about this, taking it from the midst of another nation, th this was a most extraordinary thing that a whole people consisting of upwards of 600,000 men, not to mention the women and children, should without a striking blow be brought out of the midst of a very powerful nation to the political welfare of which their services were so essential. Think about it, all the work that the Israelites did for that country. That they should be brought out in so open and public a manner that the sea itself should be supernaturally divided to afford this mighty host a passage, and that in a desert utterly unfriendly to human life, they should be sustained for 40 years. These were such, such instances of the almighty power and goodness of God as never could be forgotten. Never. But then it goes on to say, taking them out of this nation by testings, by miraculous signs and sorry, miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds. I want to spend a little time on that. So there are seven different things that Moses mentions to them that the Lord Almighty used in getting Israel out of Egypt. The first one, the testings which are the miracles of God wrought to try the faith and prove the obedience of the children of Israel. I mean, think a minute. Moses comes to him and says, hey, come on, we're going to leave. We're going to leave Egypt. We're going we're gonna to skedaddle. Uh, no, 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 no. They didn't believe it at first, did they? Who sent you? Who are you? Second thing is signs. God gave them signs, particularly the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, keeping near them day and night and always directing their journeys, even to the point of letting them know where to set their tents up. We almost take that for granted when we read, when we read that in the Old Testament. Pillar of fire, pillar of cloud. It's almost like, can you imagine? You know, for some of you who are old enough, you remember the show Bewitched or I Dream of Genie. You know, they were able to make things float. And we, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are inundated today with so many things from a special effects standpoint, you, know, you see it on a movie, oh, there's a pillar of cloud, yeah, that's, that's nothing. Can you imagine living during this time and seeing that? They didn't have television back then. They didn't see all those special effects that we have nowadays. We can make almost anything appear on TV or on a movie. That's not what this is, boys and girls. This is the power of God. Yeah, real life. The third thing is wonders. To persuade is what that word actually means, those wonders. Persuasive facts and events, whether strictly miraculous or just exceeding the powers of nature itself. Turning the staff into a snake. Plagues of Egypt. The same word is used in a persuasive manner in Zechariah 3 verse 8 where it says, Joshua the high priest and his companions were typical men raised up by God as types of Christ and proofs that God would bring his servant the branch. If you've not spent any time reading the book of Zechariah, that would be a good place to start. Chapter 3, verse 8. All the dealings of God with his people and even the people themselves were types, present indicators of distant facts and future occurrences. So God was already telling them about Jesus coming, the branch. The next one is war, such as those with the Amalekites, the Amorites, and the Bashanites, in which the hand of God was seen rather than the hand of man. And then it talks about a mighty hand, one that is strong 
to deal its blows, irresistible in its operations, and grasps the enemy hard so they cannot escape and protects its friends so powerfully that they cannot be injured. Neither stratagem nor policy was used in this business, but the openly displayed power of God. The next one is an outstretched arm. A series of almighty operations followed each other in quick, astonishing successions. But there are several things within that outstretched arm that I thought was kind of interesting as I read this one commentary. You start out with the finger of God. It denotes any manifestation of the divine power where effects are produced beyond the power of art or nature. It's specifically mentioned when it talks about the plague of gnats. Writing of the Ten Commandments, it says the finger of God. Then you have the hand of God, which signifies the same power, but put forth in a more signal manner. And one instance of this being mentioned, this hand of God, is talking about bringing the unity of mind together in Judah to accomplish the tasks set forth. That's in Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 12. Then you have the arm of God. The divine omnipotence manifested in the most stupendous miracles. And then lastly, you have the arm of a, of a God stretched out. The same omnipotence exerted in a continuation of stupendous miracles, both in a way of judgment and mercy. And it appears at least 16 times throughout the, the Bible, six of which are in the book of Deuteronomy. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the last one of these seven that it talks about where it says, or by great and awesome deeds. In the King James Version, it calls it terrors. But such terrors or great deeds uh, are, can be of dismay and consternation as were produced by the ten plagues, to which probably the inspired penman here alludes, being Moses. Or the Septuagint actually has it with great or pretentious deeds, such as that when God looked out of the cloud, remember the, he was the cloud, pillar of cloud, looked out, saw the Egyptians coming in their chariots, and said, nah, that ain't going to happen, and knocked the wheels off of the chariots as he watched them coming. More awful displays of God's judgment, power, and might were never witnessed by man. You know, when we, when we really stop and think and put our logical thinking hat on, you think, how in the world did all of this happen? And why did God pick these folks out? I mean, look how stubborn they were. Look how obstinate they were. Look how nutty they were. I can't think of a better word. But God chose them. And then I stop back and I look, well, how stubborn am I? How obstinate am I? How nutty can I be? I can be pretty nutty if I need to. And he still wants me as his son. He still wants you as a son and daughter. Man, that's some good stuff. All right. Yeah, we are not going to make it into uh, chapter 5. I'll tell you that right now. Verse 41, and, and some think from verse 41 to the end of this chapter that it was written by either Joshua or Ezra, not by Moses himself, and pretty much because it's written in third person, if you will. Then Moses, verse 41, then Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan to which anyone who had been killed or who had killed a person could flee if he had unintentionally killed his neighbor without malice afterthought. He could flee into one of these cities and save his life. The cities were these, Bezer in the desert plateau for the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the, Ma the Manassites. This is one of those that I had asked Dana about. What's Moses doing here? Is he just going out on his own and deciding he's going to make these cities of refuge? Because that's what it says, right? In verse 41, it says, Then Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan. No. If you go back and you look in Exodus, it talks about 
how God had established those cities. And actually, there are six of those cities that he established. And it was for individuals who accidentally killed someone that they could go for refuge. And, well, why did they have to go anywhere for refuge? Go back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. It says that anyone who dies by the hand of another can be killed by the avenger, if you will, which is typically kin of the person who was killed. There was, there, there was no trial. There was no judge, no jury. If Graham killed someone that I know, I could come to Graham and just kill him. It didn't matter. But God established these six cities, three on the east of the Jordan, three on the west of the Jordan. These are the ones that are on the east side, right? Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Then Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan. So this is in the land that they are currently occupying before they cross over the Jordan River. So these are the ones for the two and a half tribes that decided to stay on the, on the initial side of the Jordan River. But what I find interesting, though, is as these cities were set up, and by the way, as I was reading these to this guy that goes to the rabbinical synagogue, he said I didn't do, do too bad on the pronunciations. I was pretty pleased with myself. But what was interesting that was brought up as we studied these, these cities of refuge When you look at the names and you look at the original Hebrew language and the meanings that the names held behind them, these cities of refuge are generally understood, work with me here, are generally understood to be types of the salvation provided by Christ for sinners. So their names have been thought to express some attribute of the Redeemer of mankind. Now here it only mentions the three, but I'm going to read to you all six names, now that I know how to pronounce them. The first one is Kadesh. Kadesh, in the original Hebrew language, means to separate or set apart, because it implies the consecration of a person or thing to the worship or service of God alone. Hence, to make or be holy, and hence holiness the full consecration of a person to God. The second one is Shechem, to be ready, forward, and diligent. The term is used for like a shoulder because of its readiness to bear burdens, to prop up, to sustain. Does that not sound like characteristics of Jesus Christ? The third one, Hebron, to associate, join, or conjoin, to unite as friends or fellowship or friendly association. Man. And then the three that are listed here in this passage, Bezer, which it means to restrain or enclose, shut up or encompass with a wall, and hence the goods or treasure thus secured, and hence a fortified place. A fortress. The second one, Ramoth, to be raised, made high or exalted. High places, eminences. That's Jesus. And then the last one, Golan, which means to remove, transmigrate. That's a funny word. Transmigrate or pass away. Hence, Golan, a transmigration or passage. Moving us from our sinful nature to our glory through Jesus Christ. But some derive that it actually, that word in the Hebrew means rejoice or rejoicing or exaltation. Anyway, I thought that was kind of a a neat little twist there on when we look at the Old Testament and think, oh, that's, that's all history stuff. No, guys, it's all pointing to Jesus. And here it is, listing those characteristics of Jesus Christ. Verse 44 is a continuation of those last few verses that were thought to be written by either Joshua or Ezra. Verse 44, it says, This is the law Moses set before the Israelites. 
These are the stipulations, decrees, and laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt and were in the valley near Beth Peor, east of the Jordan, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and was defeated by Moses and the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. They took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan. This land extended from Aror. Sound good? Aror. I didn't get to practice that one with the Messianic Jew. On the rim of the Arnon Gorge to Mount Sihon, that is Hermon, and included all the Arabah east of the Jordan as far as the Sea of Arabah below the slopes of Pisgah. So, as we read through all of this, to me it is obvious that it is pointing us to Christ, number one. Number two, it reminds us that even though we might not have seen these things, we've seen the miraculous hand of God in our own lives. And that we need to constantly bring that to memory as we read through his word and we stand on his promises that he has made to us as believers and to not turn to the left or to the right of obeying the word of God. Now, I'm going to flip back just a couple of verses to verse 37. And this kind of ties into a little bit of chapter 5, but I'm going to, we're going to do it anyway. Chapter, 30, or chapter 4, verse 37, it says, Because he loved your forefathers and chose their descendants after them. This is the first time that, with everything else about obeying and following, that it says God loved the people. The first time love had been mentioned, God's love had been mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. But when you look at and there are several passages through here uh, in Deuteronomy where it was, it's mentioned over and over and over again. But look at verse 10 of chapter 5. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. That's the type of God we serve, guys. He's not a mean God with a magnifying glass trying to get us, burn us with the, the sun rays. He wants a relationship with us. That, that, first and foremost, he wants a relationship with us. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. He wants us to be involved in his service and in his love for others. And he wants our heart to serve him. 100% of the time. And Bob, how can I do that? Listen, it's going to be a matter of spending some time in prayer. It's going to be spending some time with the Word. You know, if in my younger days, I didn't used to spend a whole lot of time reading this. I thought, uh, I'll hear about it on Sunday. I didn't spend much time in it. Can you imagine, Dana and I, we've been married 32 years. There's times when we speak, or I speak to her as often as I used to read this, but it puts a real big strain on the marriage. You've got to have constant communication with those that you love. And actions speak louder than words. Church, it's, it, it's this, this isn't just a, something we check off the list and say, yep, I read it today. It's reading it for understanding so that we can truly know that God loves us and we know what he is asked or is asking of us as we move forward in life. This morning we're going to take communion. And uh, if the ushers would come, we're going to hand out the elements. And listen, if... You've never participated in communion before, but you are a believer. You are welcome to take a piece of the unleavened bread in the form of a cracker. And we've got the grape juice.
And we're going to take it all at one time. So if you would, after you receive the elements, just kind of hang on to it. <clears throat> but communion is a time where we can come together in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross where he laid down his life so that we can have eternal life in heaven. I don't like to just say eternal life because everyone's going to have eternal life. Some are going to have it in heaven and some are going to have it in hell. The word is very clear on that. But as we participate in this communion, I just want you to reflect on what God has been doing in your life. The Bible tells us not to take communion in an unworthy manner. That if you've sinned against someone or if someone's sinned against you, that in your heart that you go to forgive that individual who sinned against you in your heart. And that you go and seek forgiveness of those that you may have done wrong to. Because the Bible tells us that if we have unforgiven sins in our life, He will not forgive us our sins. The Bible t- tells us that. But He is faithful and just, and when we come to Him and ask for forgiveness, again, they're as far as the east is from the west. <clears throat>